welcome everybody. Welcome everybody. I hope you had a great day listening to all of the breakout sessions and the panels and the uh, lightning talks and the main stage. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, I'm really excited to uh, be able to moderate this panel discussion. Uh, the topic for this session is uh, making CD work in the real world. And we're really privileged to be sitting here with four of the amazing speakers of the day. Um, to introduce myself first, I'm Cora Iberclyde. I am a developer advocate at VMware. And uh, so let me give you a quick overview of who's, who's in this panel, and then I'll direct you on where to go to post your questions. So uh, first of all, we've got um, uh, Bella Rotaby, who I'll have each of them introduce themselves in a little bit more detail. But just to remind you, she gave the talk, DevOps in the real world, know what it takes to make it work. Then we're going to have uh, also on this panel, we've got Jason Yi, who gave the talk uh, with the great uh, door metaphor, the adjacent possible evolution, innovation, and catastrophe. Uh, then we are also having this discussion, uh, Kat Cosgrove, who gave that really interesting talk on the history of CICD. And um, we've got Cornelia Davis here with us today. Uh, she gave the, the one of the last breakouts on the business benefits of GitOps. So if you have questions for any of those panelists, please hop over to the Slack channel, which is basically panel discussion, panel dash discussion dash, and then the name of this panel, making CD work in the real world. So post your questions in there. If you want me to relay your question to the speakers, just post your question and we'll get to as many questions as possible. We've got about maybe 45 minutes or so, maybe an hour, depending on how many questions we're getting in, we're kind of gonna, we're gonna go with the flow. And if you wanna pop up on the screen and ask your question live, just note uh, with your question that you want to be live um, and we're gonna make that happen for you. You can pop up with us and ask your question in, per uh, in person. So um, also remember that after this, there's party games, which is gonna be a whole lot of fun. So make some time for that. Uh, and especially because one of our panelists is going to be part of that party news. So it'll be extra fun because we get to know her a little bit better in the course of the next 30 minutes and then watch her play a game. So, um, yeah, I think we're ready to go. Let's welcome our panelists and uh, start the conversation. Cool. So welcome, everybody. Great to have you. Really phenomenal talks today. Um, I want to start by just giving each of you a chance to introduce yourself. So, so please, we can go around and uh, Kat, Jason, Bola, and then Cornelia, please, please go ahead. Sure. Hey, y'all. Uh, my name is Kat Cosgrove. I'm a staff developer advocate at Pulumi. So uh, I sling infrastructure as code in a real programming language that you're already familiar with. Um, big fan of not having to learn new tools, but um, I spoke earlier about CICD and the history of it because we miss a lot of context on uh, the actual history of tools if we don't like live through it. And it turns out that CI has been around for a really long time. So uh, anybody like around my age, I'm 31, probably doesn't have the historical context for why CICD is the way it is today. Hey everyone, I'm Jason Yi. I'm the director of advocacy at a company called Gremlin. We build a reliability platform that helps you do chaos engineering in a safe and easy way, which is what my talk was about earlier, um, about exploring the adjacent possibilities of failure and starting to educate yourself about what failure looks like so that when it happens, you could be more knowledgeable and hopefully with that knowledge, you can build more reliable systems. Hi everyone, my name is Bola Rotaby. I'm the research director for software development delivery um, um, at um, in analyst for CCS Insight. Um, well, I gave the earlier uh, uh, presentation on the yes, we're making DevOps work in the real world. What it, what does it take to make it work? And um, actually, I spend a lot of my time, you know, sort of, I almost feel like I'm always back at university a lot of the time, <laughs> reading up on lots of stuff and actually talking to a lot of end user organizations right across the market landscape, you know, sort of, um, you know, from, you know, sort of FSI or telcos or, you know, sort of, um, 
um, public sector and just getting to understand what they're doing with DevOps and how, you know, the challenges they face as well as how they get to resolve them as well. So that was what my talk was a little bit about and some of the things that we see in the market today. Okay, I think that leaves me. Uh, my name is Cornelia Davis. I am so delighted to be here with this uh, star-studded panel. I'm, I'm really humbled and honored. Um, I have spent the last 10 years or so working on developer platforms, um, DevOps platforms, really. Uh, I was at Pivotal for quite a number of years from the time that it was spun out of VMware and EMC in 2013 until uh, the early days of 2020, at which point I joined WeaveWorks um, and uh, was CTO there. Um, and th that is, that's the company that did GitOps, um, that kind of coined the term GitOps and still focuses greatly in that, in that uh, GitOps space. Um, and just very recently in the last couple of months, I've joined Amazon um, and what I do for a living, what I do at all of those organizations is that uh, my passion is around um, working in emerging tech spaces. So 10 years ago or nine years ago, certainly developer platforms and the way that we do them for microservices was very emerging. And then Kubernetes was emerging. And, um, and so I love to work in emerging tech spaces, but really look for the business value and work with organizations to find and glean the business value and realize the business value from those emerging technologies. So that's what I do for a living. Awesome. Um, so I have a couple of questions to start with. Um, it seems like everyone is really good at CI. I don't know if that's exactly true. I think people struggle with CI, but CI is definitely older than CD and people seem to do CI first uh, before they can wrap their heads around doing CD. Um, so how much CD do you actually think people are doing? I, I will go since I <laughs> just gave a whole talk on this. <laughs> um, so it depends on what you mean by CD. So if you mean continuous delivery, then uh, I think that's that's really common now and you don't really see CI without like some measure of CD as much, at least not in like companies or teams or orgs that are trying to stay like relatively modern. Uh, if by CD you mean continuous deployment, I don't think we see that as often as we should. People tend to shy away from automating the deployment piece, the actual mm -hmm. like push it to the users, push to prod, which I think is ridiculous. It, it does not make you any better at building bug-free software to have a human involved in pressing the deploy button. It really, it just, it just doesn't. So it's, that is the thing that I think we should be doing more of uh, than we are currently seeing, but like CD in general, um, like some, some measure of automating the process of you know, like building and at least delivering an update. I think that's really common now. Mm. Yeah, so, I, I'd just so like I'll... to add. No, please, no. go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I'd just like to add to that. I mean, I, I, Kat, I think that was, uh, you know, you're right about getting sort of like, you know, automation in there. But I would caution, and I, you know, sort of hate to say this, partly because, you know, there are some organizations who feel, and maybe it's a kind of confidence feeling, as whether they actually feel that, you know, sort of um, confidence in their automation, you know, I oh, think no, that- it's um, totally a confident thing. I agree, yeah. yeah. And, and also partly because I think also the thing is that the consequences of getting the automation wrong, especially for instance, if you may be a public sector um, um, that's doing with tax, you know, sort of uh, tax codes and things like that. Um, and, you know, so they like to in, instill a sort of, a, you know, a checkpoint, a human sort of just to re check that this is absolutely going to be okay but it's a confidence thing but i i agree i mean that's exactly the kind of thing that automation is actually really really important um but i think it's one of those things when it, it's you know at that last mile you know that you know just before into production i think that's when people get a bit trepidous especially when the automation is on acting on something that's really quite you know sort of could have quite calamitous effect if it went wrong <laughs> Oh yeah, it's definitely a confidence thing um, that you know people are people are uncomfortable trusting that the automation that they wrote is is enough that it's robust that it's going to do the thing correctly. But uh, 
you're like a, a person isn't any better or any more reliable at doing those things than a computer is. <laughs> you know, like we, we have bad days and the computer doesn't really, unless, you know, whoever told it to do the thing was having a bad day when they told it to do the thing. So I don't know. It, it is a confidence thing. It totally is. It's just, it's a thing we've, we've got to get over. Cause like, if you like automating the deployment is going to lead to when you eventually push a bad update, cause you're gonna, no matter whether a person is involved in pressing the deploy button or not, having the deployment process automated too means that you can you can roll that back more quickly, or you can turn off a feature flag, or you can push a new update faster, which is the point, right? But yeah, you're right; it's totally a confidence thing. Well, also, you and say that you can roll that... back. Carry on, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I think the thing as you start to think of that human in, in the loop, right, that human at the end of the process that's evaluating thing, I, my big question to most people that haven't automated the deployment is, what is your human process? Right? Because mm -hmm. if you've ever asked people that, the human process is, well, I went back and I ensured that those tests were green. It's like... <laughs> Well, that's useless. Like, they were green. You got the report. Like you are literally not doing anything. Why nothing. are you it's there? It's a safety blanket. It is literally. It is a child security blanket. That's what it but is. Do you think? Do you think? Uh, cause sometimes when I when I look at this, I think, you know, we've advanced so much in how we can do CD in this case in the topic of this question. Um, but was it realistic to expect? That C I mean, CD has gotten easier because the underlying mechanisms on which we can do CD have gotten easier to work with. Uh, so, which brings up for me another question, right? It's, it's easier to do CD on Kubernetes because Kubernetes is just simpler to, to automate. And where does that leave organizations that are a little bit more that ha you know haven't haven't transitioned yet to Kubernetes, or or all organizations except for like the new startups that have to manage something some heritage software as well as Kubernetes. What is like, so, what is the CD challenge for them? Yeah, so so I'm I'm sorry. I want to back up just a little bit. I, I'll come back to this, but I want to back up a little bit to the initial question that you asked, which I think is really interesting. And I think um, the the thing that I want us to reflect on there is that we started a conversation in CD with CI, and um, in part that's our own fault because we've been using a word a single word that isn't a single word, and that's CICD. Now, I do think that you're, when you asked the question, you reflected that we've le reached some level of maturity with CI, and the conversation so far has been around how we haven't reached that same level of maturity with CD. But we haven't defined the CD problem as an industry well enough yet for people to understand that just doing, to Kat's point, a delivery as the last step in my, in my Jenkins pipeline is not continuous deployment. It isn't giving you that what, what we're aiming for with the whole CD movement. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to, for the, for the, or for the, the industry, is we need to keep educating that there's a separation between CI and CD because that also gets to this idea of if I just add the automation, if I just, I mean, a lot of people think they're doing CD because they have automated, even, even if they, even if they do automate the deployment, they're do, they've just added that as a last step to CI, but there's a whole host of problems that we need to deal with that are not um, characterized very well in a CI pipeline. So I, I wanted to make sure that we brought that in because I think it's super important to listeners that they recognize that there is a distinct difference between CI and CD, even if there's a relationship. No, that's a, that's a really, really good point. And I, I think the thing is, is that I, I think for a lot of organizations, when they start to think about, you know, continuous deployment, actually it becomes, you know, much more complex, you know, the more, you know, sort of um, the more complex the application is and the more pipelines they start to think about. And I think the other thing is that when people start thinking about, you know, their development environment, the staging environment, their deployment, you know, sort of the production environment, 
then they have to sort of start thinking about how they kind of make those transitions into kind of that, that continuous deployment. And I don't think it's a straightforward story, um, which is why I think for a lot of organizations, they actually have to make sometimes a choice about, and I, and I talked about this in my you know, you know, sort of presentation, that some, some people are now sort of going to kind of, um, you know, sort of, um, you know, whether it's Jenkins or whether they're doing it on the cloud with, you know, they um, use now Azure DevOps or or they're actually rolling their own scripting environments for CI, CD. And I think that that suddenly makes, you know, organizations sometimes who, haven't, who aren't confident necessarily think about, well, okay, am I going to kind of do this role my own or am I going to use another tool that is allows me to do a level of pre-configuration? So I think it's, I think actually you're right, Kat, Totally agree that it should be automated, and in fact, that's that's what people would probably you know like to think that they're doing. But I think actually, when they start to sit down and think about it, it starts to become a much more maybe more complex considerations, especially depending on the application that they're actually you know um, looking at you know sort of doing the continuous deployment against. I think that uh, maybe that ties in well with one of the questions that we that we got on Slack. Um, Dormain Druitz is asking. Uh, on the notion that we were talking about earlier of building confidence, she says that really resonates and asks, how does an individual team build that confidence, even if the org around them isn't necessarily trying? <sighs> That's hard. <laughs> like the, the culture, the culture problem with, of, of DevOps, like, you know, we, DevOps people, we, we absolutely love going. DevOps is a culture, not a tool set. And like, getting kind of snotty about it. We love doing that. Um, but the culture is the hard part, you know, uh, mm -hmm. tools, tools can be hard. Co tools can absolutely be hard. Like look at Kubernetes has a reputation for being outrageously difficult, but the people are more complicated than programs. And I, I don't know really how to, um, unravel that, um, other than maybe like starting small, you know, mm. um, automating like more and more things, building confidence over time in the quality of your automation to get people more comfortable with the idea of, hey, you know, like instead of you looking at this every single day, every single time that you want to build something, why don't we instead iterate on the automation slowly over time, piece by piece, until you get more comfortable with it? Like you, you're still building a thing, and you still get something to to work on and fuss over and iterate. But it it's something that over time makes things faster and more secure and more reliable for you and the rest of your team and your org, and more importantly, because this is still a business, your users. So I, I really think it's a it's a baby steps kind of situation for me at least. Yeah. Um, but I don't manage I people and I wouldn't that. want to. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I mean one there's that. another let's go let's go Jason. Let's go Jason Cornelia Bola. Mix it up a little. All right. <laughs> So I was going to say, as far as the baby steps to automation, I think that's great. I think the other thing that you have to question is, where are you lacking confidence, right? What is it about the process that you are uncertain of? And oftentimes that's, well, I'm afraid that I'm going to roll out some software and it's going to break production. It's going to have unforeseen consequences. And to me, and, you know, I'm heavily biased for this as someone that works in chaos engineering and formerly worked for a monitoring company. But to me, those are the big things is build up your confidence in your monitoring, right? You should know almost immediately if you deploy bad code, right? You should see metrics that indicate that something's wrong. And to Kat's point earlier, if you automated that, if you detect it early, you should be able to roll that back pretty quickly. And then the other thing is, well, aside from being able to see things, how, how confident are you in responding to things? And a lot of that comes down to, are you practicing? Are you running fire drills and game days? If you're not confident in the automation, you should at least be confident in your ability to respond and troubleshoot and then roll back. Mm. Yeah, yeah I, the thing that I would add is the thing that I would add is that um, yes, the culture and and changing people's comfort level with change and and risk is is something that is difficult, and we certainly 
should not expect to just change those minds based on faith. Hey, we're doing a great job. We've got this automation, have faith in us. So we, we need to show things. So back to the question of how do we get started? One of the things that I think um, is quite valuable is to demonstrate failures. Now I am, and, and importantly, not just demonstrate the failure, but also demonstrate the safety nets that are saving you. So Jason was just talking about some of those safety nets in terms of observability. And we've been talking about automation all the way along, being able to do automatic rollbacks and things like that. I'm not suggesting we want to demonstrate that to show this to people in our production environments, but we can certainly start putting some of these things in place in a staging environment. And show, don't just show the happy path, but show what happened when you did a deployment into staging and everything went upside down and show the metrics that our mean time for recovery in the staging environment was on the order of 30 seconds. We have these safety nets in place. And those safety nets are gonna be the thing that is going to introduce a level of comfort. Um, but the only way you can do that is we can talk about them academically and theoretically, but the only way you can do that if, is if you can demonstrate things. Yeah. And as a chaos uh, engineering person, I'd argue that you can do that in production. So I I, I'm, yeah. I, I, I agree. I agree. You can do it. In, yeah, I, I agree that you can do it in production. And, and in fact, years ago, when I was chatting with Pivotal customers, I one of the most provocative things I used to love to do when we were in briefings was say, I'm actually asking you to experiment in production. I'm asking you. And that usually got like a really audible response. Um, I am. But if you're if you are working in a large enterprise organization and what you're trying to do, in fact, is just get buy in from, let's say, your executive leadership or maybe the middle management, because they're the ones whose butts are on the line, um, is maybe you you demonstrate that the first time elsewhere. But ultimately, 100 percent, I want us to experiment in production. No, no question. One thing I would add to all of that, because I actually think, you know, I don't really add, I don't really have much else to add other than that. I totally agree with you all. Um, I think the other thing I would probably say is that um, I think sometimes people forget that what they can do and what they have been doing, you know, the, to a certain extent, there's every, you know, people sort of say, well, how do I build this, you know, confidence? But the fact is, you kind of have to look at, well, how long have I been programming? How long have I been practicing? How long have I been in the team you know the thing is is that we're asking to have confidence but you're actually doing the job already so to a certain extent you're kind of like you know well I'm already in an environment right so absolutely what everybody ever or else says it's all about having the right tools to help support you having that visibility having that you know sort of monitoring a lot of times the the reality is that in a lot of organizations, they don't really have those tools. So maybe that's one of the reasons where the confidence isn't coming in because you haven't got the tools. You can't actually see all of what, you can't tunnel all the way down. You don't have that observability, all of those things. So to a certain extent is that, you know, yeah, yes, you're going to have to go and invest a little bit of um, money in getting the right tools, start off small, all of those kind of things. But to be honest with you guys, you know, if you've been programming for quite a while, if you've been in a team for a number of years, if you've been sort of delivering an application, you know, even in an on-premise environment, you're not sort of, you know, the fact is you kind of have already got a level. So don't start second guessing yourself to a certain extent. So, you know, so that's one thing I would say, but then get the tools, get the insight, get the things and start off small because actually, you're right, you can sort of demonstrate on a small by small step. You can sort of do something in production if you kind of feel that is, you know, use your kind of, you know, sort of head a bit. If it's, you know, something that you think, well, actually, it's not mission critical. I'm sure Jason would say you can do it on mission critical, but, you know, I'm an engineer from background and I would probably say, hold on just a minute. But if it's not mission critical, that's a nice thing to start off with. And if you've got past metrics, then you can demonstrate to other people what has changed, what the value you've brought. But I would say that, yes, it's about confidence, but do you know what? Have a bit of belief as well in yourself and your team. Oh, yeah, that was uplifting. 
<laughs> Very much so. I love it. <laughs> um, we do. I'm so looking through the the, pan, the questions from the audience, and we do have another question that kind of is more similar in spirit to this. But I'm going to go back and forth a little bit and go to a more sort of a tactical oriented question. So we have Johan Hernfeld asking, "I would love to hear some thoughts about handling databases and schema changes. Do you have any thoughts on that?" Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, she's, no one's rushing out to handle that one. So, so I'll chime in. I'll 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 I'll, uh, I'll jump in. So one of one of the things that and I'm going to give I completely admit that this answer is going to be a somewhat a when we finally get to the end point. So let me describe what the ultimate goal is. The ultimate goal is shared nothing architectures, and um, and. The reason that schema changes are a bit of a problem here is that we are sharing databases. Now, oftentimes we're sharing databases across multiple different services. That is like the worst because now those services need to be in lockstep and all of that. But even when it comes to something like multiple versions of a service, and I talked earlier about progressive delivery and having multiple versions of services running side by side, if those require two different schemas at the back end, how, do, how on earth do I do that? And the answer is shared nothing. You don't even share the database from version one of the system to version, version two of the service. And there are a number of really interesting patterns. And this, this is di diverging a little bit from the topic of CICD, but it, if you will, it's a kind of prerequisite to really getting to the end goal of these continuous deployment, continuous delivery, continuous deployment. And that is, there's data architectures that say the data doesn't live in a centralized database, or even if it does, the way that it's consumed, and those techies in the room, I'm talking about CQRS to some extent, the way it gets consumed is that each service has its own view of the data. And there's interesting patterns around event-driven systems and things like that. And so what you do when you bring on version two of the system is that as a part of the deployment process of version two, you need to hydrate the database with the new schema, Hyd hydrate that database. So now you can still have version one and version two. We were talking about safety nets. That's one of the biggest safety nets is you can have two versions running side by side so that you can flip back and forth. So it's you have to change your data patterns. You cannot expect to keep your data patterns the same and be able to do these, these continuous deployment things. You have to look at your data architecture. I think that's critical for, you know, we talk a lot about if you deploy something, if, if it's automated, you can deploy it, you can roll it back. But the truth is that if you're deploying database or schema changes, you need a little bit more of those prerequisites, as you're saying. I think there's a lot of prerequisites assumed when we talk about CD. Yeah. Maybe that's, I don't know if you all want to comment on um, some of what those prerequisites are or how to, how to maybe categorize them or go about them. Oof, there are like, I, I've watched entire hour long conference talks on the like schema database CICD topic, uh, like multiple, uh, very interesting hour long conference talks. I, that is a super complex topic. And uh, it's also a super, like th there isn't one answer there, there are, it is so extremely situational. Uh, it's it's going to. I hate to pull the the senior engineer thing, but it depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah, I knew you were. I knew where you were going with that. <laughs> the classic. <laughs> yeah. It just does. Though. Like I know that feels like such a such a cop out, but like it it does depend. <laughs> so I have a question. I guess. Mm -hmm. I was no, just saying, I think what it is about a good yeah. point, actually, mm -hmm. that whole sort of share, sort of yeah. um, share nothing. And I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's a pattern. There are clear patterns that, you know, sort of work and that you have to think about, you know, I'm starting, you know, you know, either from scratch or I just have that no pre you know, previous knowledge. So I think, I think the thing is, it's, but it's one of those, those things where, you know, and I'm not going to sort of say, you know, 
you know, sort of anything from sort of expertise because it's not something I, you know, deal a lot with. So um, uh, from that perspective, but I do feel that there are kind of patterns out there. I think Cornelia, you're right, absolutely. I've heard, you know, that kind of pattern before. And I think you, people have to think about, you know, that whole planning, you know, point and, you know, sort of thinking about that kind of architecture, what you're actually trying to achieve as well and how often that's going to kind of like you're expecting that you know, schema to change you know what is that application going to be you know doing all the time so i think you've got to think from there from that point oh i think we've lost category yeah, it, we it lost very category. much depends on her. Yeah. yeah she went over to the games yeah i yeah, no, jason I, I definitely want to i i wanted to hear from you and i also wanted to ask you um in your experience with chaos engineering you know, at what point, at what, you know, at what point do, do the databases start to kind of come into that picture and the back compatibility checks and things like that on top of what you were going to say on your own? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that in, in two parts, right? There is there is no one clear answer, although formerly at MongoDB, so I guess I could throw that out there and say NoSQL, right? That was the whole hype a, a few years back is... You don't have to worry about schema changes because there's no schema. Uh, but that said, actually, the funny thing is from my time there and looking at how it actually works, it was exactly that point of having multiple copies, right? The idea was if you want a quick query, just dupe it into the form that you want. And so, and yes, there's going to be issues with data consistency and syncing those up, and you just have to deal with that, right? It's just, it's one of the things that we deal with with distributed systems is consistency. So uh, it really does depend. That said, to the second point of the question is chaos engineering is a lot of our customers are dealing with that. How do we deal with data and particularly availability and consistency? And so that's something that you should be testing for. And when it comes to CICD, you know, these, this idea, if we're automating all of this, then yes, we need to be testing that stuff as well, right? When I go to deploy something, I need to actually, with my tests, not just ensure that I have unit tests and, and other things, but in terms of gaining confidence, how can I gain confidence if the data store is down or if I'm getting old data? You know, what is my application? What do I expect it to do? Um, and writing those into into my tests. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have actually, the one thing that. I, I just want to chime in and say, I absolutely don't want to give up on the goals of progressive delivery and continuous deployment just because I have data. Mm. Because you know what? I always have data. We've got to solve that problem. There's actually a follow-up question from, from Johan Wentz, who asked the question originally, who says, uh, if you have any recommendations on where uh, he can read up on the patterns that you're talking about. Um, so I hear patterns like you know no shared no, no shared data architectures, uh, you know back compatibility, chaos engineering. That, yes, go Cornell. <laughs> I totally do. Read Martin Kleppman's book. It is it is a tomb, and it is he's it's unbelievable. Um, you can also look for talks from Martin Kleppman. Um, I also would recommend that you take a look uh, for the most modern patterns. Um, I found uh, the Kafka Summit to be a really great source of some of these innovative ideas around event-driven systems, because of course Kafka is at the core. It is kind of the premier open source technology that um, can drive some of these patterns. Um, and I haven't looked lately, but last time I looked, Martin was, was working for a uh, Confluent. So Martin Kleppman's book is so worth the investment in kind of radically changing. We've talked about these changing architectures. I wrote a book on changing co the compute side. Martin wrote a book on changing the data side to modern system, to modern, to these modern needs. So Martin Kleppman's book, that's my first recommendation. Cool. Any others to add before I go to the next question? We're going to all right, um, so the next question we have here is from Vitali Zipris, who asks, what are some good ways to bring ops and dev teams together? Says, I find more ops teams are asked to become DevOps teams and traditional ops admins know very little, if anything, about Kubernetes, cloud native architecture, CI, and CD. Oh, that's a good one, actually. Um, it's interesting, actually. I would say that um, you know the ops teams, and you know, and it, and it depends on um, um, yeah, sort of um, uh, how much they're actually sort of um, scripting and how much they're doing sort of you know sort of um, you know 
adding code to their um, to their infrastructure. But I would actually say, and certainly that you know, some of the the organisations that we we speak to, in fact, actually the a lot of the ops you know team do actually have a good understanding um, of you know sort of um, the configurations required, and you know, in terms of the the runtime inv- you know, runtime requirements, say like for containers and Kubernetes. And it'd be quite surprising that even though they think that you know this is a dev you know sort of you know um, a dev sort of world in fact actually i think the ops team can actually bring a lot more in terms of the runtime capabilities and i think that is something that you know that needs to be kind of recognized you know um so one of the other things is that we're not going to bring them together by letting them just sit on their own and explain, you know, sort of just talking to themselves. I think the only way you can bring them together is actually bringing them together inside of, you know, a kind of, um, you know, sort of team structure, you know, in terms of, you know, in terms of, you know, sort of, you know, you know, taking a, a a process or an application that you know that people are building, and then looking at what needs to be you know what needs to be deployed or what needs to be you know pushed out into the production, and then actually working together in turn. Because one of the things I talked to one organisation that actually a lot of the times you're asking development um, roles to make you know configuration changes right at the start or, you know, their containers or, you know, sort of Kubernetes environment, where, in fact, actually operation roles would actually have a much clearer idea of what that might look like or how that might behave once out in production or into the runtime. And, in fact, actually are probably much more suited to kind of really, you know, sort of understanding the uh, the consequences. But the problem is, once it's out into production and they need to check, make a change, um, you know, it's it's a bit late. So... So that's that's one of the things. So I actually think bringing them together. Um, Sorry, um, <laughs> we're just having a, a little mix up here. The because you, you guys can hear that, right? Um, I uh, I didn't realize, Vitaly, that you wanted to ask your question live. I'm sorry, I didn Didn't have that information quickly That's enough, okay. but I'm glad that you're on screen to hear the answer. <laughs> so if you have a follow up <laughs> once they're at, once they're done asking, uh, please go ahead. So, in, but in the meantime, welcome Vitaly to the panel. I'm sorry, I didn't have that really enough to Thank introduce you. No your worries. <laughs> no, no worries. But go ahead. Sorry, uh, Mola. I... Mola. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, no. I, I do I appreciate it. Vitaly, do you uh, do you feel like your question was answered? Do you have any follow up? Uh, I do have a follow up, if you don't mind. Um, one of the concerns and one of the things that I see and hear is that uh, the language—it's almost like a language barrier, right? A developer is talking his language, right? They 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 are talking what they're used to doing and how they're used to speak to their peers. Uh, the administrator from the operations team probably never even heard this language. So how do you bridge that kind of gap, right? Because yes, I agree, the operations team has more insight on how, uh, like on the infrastructure level, right? How these applications may be run and may need to be handled like from a day two perspective. Uh, but a developer, he's really worried about code and you know that sort of thing. So he knows nothing about ops, and ops now knows nothing about dev. Uh, and so it literally is like a language barrier. So that's I'm wondering what are your thoughts on how we can breach that? I mean, I, I think that's a very good and uh, sorry. I think we have some kind of a delay, but <laughs> well, why don't we take Jason first and then Cornelia? Sounds good. Go ahead, Jason. Great. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I I love that phrasing of just like a language barrier because, in my experience, most ops people know what's going on when it comes to Kubernetes and this world because a lot of it is the same stuff that they've been dealing with in terms of networking and and infrastructure. They just don't know the terms for it because it's all moved to software now. So largely, to Bola's point, is just getting them together, right? Forcing people together. Eventually, devs will teach the ops teams the terms. Ops teams will teach the devs the old terms or, or vice versa. And you, you have to be together and start a dialogue in order to start the conversation and, and learn those terms and, and build it up. And so simply, that's, that's my answer to this, is just to start. Hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would add to that. I find it very interesting that um, that you suggested, Vitali, in your initial question, that the developers are the ones that know the new infrastructure. And I'm putting air quotes around that because infrastructure mm-hmm. here, to Jason's point, has just moved up from, well, originally it was hardware. And, and initially, I do think that it's interesting that as a developer, I was one of the first people to use VMware technology before the ops teams did, because developers are often embracing these things and ex- experimenting with them. Um, but then an important thing happened when we moved from physical infrastructure to virtualized infrastructure is that the ops teams did, in fact, become the experts in that new infrastructure and I think that what we're, what the first answer I would give is that I think it's quite important that ops teams need to become conversant in the new infrastructure. In the new infrastructure, yes, it's no longer hardware. It's more and more and more software defined. We have new abstractions. We're not talking about machines anymore. We're talking about containers. And so how do you achieve that? Well, it's one of those things where you definitely need leadership um, to buy in on that. And, and help to, to turn these operations teams um, to help, le- help them level up to the technology stacks that are needed by the developers to be able to have these kind of fast iteration loops that they do. Um, and then there's a second element that I would point out as well, and that is that with the advent of these more and more modern infrastructure stacks, and I keep putting air quotes around it, we're going from it just being an infrastructure stack to being a platform. And the subtle difference between that is that is, it, is the way that we interact with those operations teams. In the past, we would go to them and say, all right, I've done the analysis, here's my application, here's the infrastructure I need from you. And by turning it, by becoming going from an infrastructure team to a platform team, and that, I think that's part of what we're talking about here in these operational teams, is we now are turning that into here are the abstractions and the things that are available to the de- the developers, the app teams, to be able to do their work. And some of these are the tool suites that Jason's been talking about. So give them the ability to have the observability on their applications, et cetera, et cetera. So there's no, the Vitaly, the whole answer is that there, there's no simple thing. We can't just put these people in a room and they can start speaking the same language, although I don't want to diminish any of that. That's all very important. But there are some fundamental changes in the way that we no longer treat infrastructure or operations as kind of a short order cook. We're now, they are delivering a platform, which is a product these application teams use. That's also really critical. Yeah, I would also add to that is that I think people have got to be get better at you know explaining what it is that they're trying to achieve. Because I think the thing is, we talk about communication and we talk about, yes, they talk their own language. But what I feel that sometimes what people don't always say is actually what they're actually trying to do or they quanti- you know, whether the, the outcome that they're trying to um, achieve or the kind of the performance that they want or all those kind of stuff. I think sometimes we've got to be you know, both parties, um, and yes, you're right, Cornelia, that you're right, it's, you know, when you talk about a platform, you get, you know, services, and you can say, well, this is what you can achieve, etc. and that is important, but I think, actually, right from the word go, is that it's almost saying, well, what is it that you're trying to say, you know, it, you know, because I think if you don't know what, that you know, you're trying to say, then it's very hard to get the other person to sort of think, okay, how am I going to meet you even to kind of understand what I can give you? So I think the narrative uh, for people has got to get better. They've got to kind of be, you know, and I think maybe this is something that we have to do inside the industry anyway, because, you know, to a certain extent, we're very good at everybody talking either in acronyms or, you know, sort of like terminology, and, and they don't really explain something that it says, well, what does it actually do? You know, they'll say a term and everyone, they expect everybody to know that. And no one's actually saying, well, what does that do? What what does it actually do? It's really quite simple. So I think that actually you're right. It is, we're moving from, you know, sort of these, you know, sort of, um, sort of um, areas where silos where we all understand this bit um, and then the other person understands the other bit to something where actually we can talk about, well, here's a platform, it 
you know it gives us services and all this kind of stuff but actually i think we've all got to be better about you know being much more you know you know sort of being clear about the narrative that we want to achieve and i think that that will help actually because actually when i've spoken to organizations often it is a case of where the dev team will say well actually this is what we really are thinking about achieving why and then the ops team might actually say oh okay this is what you really oh i get that this is this is this is a service that we can you know that you need to think about and i and i you know i just don't think that um, we do enough of that hmm um let me move to another question from the um from the slack channel which is another more sort of tactical question it, um kim evett says we use microsoft azure devops on prem what are your thoughts on pipelines and release management do you suggest other tools i did notice that you're on your slide bola actually azure, azure was the the tallest column. Yes, the it was actually. It um, it, it was. Yeah, Azure DevOps was uh, in fact, and we hear about it a lot. Um, obviously, there are other tools. There was a whole host of tools that I uh, um, identified on um, on my slide, um, including AWS, you know, um, co deploy, and you know, sort of Jenkins and all these kind of things. So, um, oh, it's a, it's a, you know, and to be honest with you, the whole kind of release management. Um, story is, you know, it has been sort of served for for a, a number of years by, you know, sort of, um, um, you know, I think the the thing is, is that, you know, whenever we talk to organisations, sometimes it's actually the point of release management is the bit that everybody gets a bit, you know, sort of um, focused on or, or lack of focus. They need to sort of think about that. And there have been other tools. I mean, you know, we can go through a whole list of them. Microfocus does release management. Other, you know, there's a whole host of them. Um, I think my, yeah, Microsoft as uh, um, um, as your DevOps is is certainly you know so, you know certainly up there. I mean, we see it a lot inside of organisations, and it's really sort of um, you know sort of you know got a sort of significant um, footprint. Um, and I think that is you know certainly a popular tool. That's all I can say. <laughs> I don't know if anyone it's, else. It's definitely yeah. You know, anyone else? It's a it's a tough question to ask to to be to recommend tools as we. Oh, well, try. as Kat would say, it depends what you want to do. It depends. It depends on the environment, <laughs> and it does depend on you know where you know you are. They're all good tools, but it also depends on where your starting point is. So you know, um, um, but as I said in my. In, when we went out um, to you know, talk to respondents in a yeah, study, you know, you know, sort of Microsoft um, as your DevOps did play a significant yeah. you know, footprint in the market. Maybe a way to reframe that question is to say, what are the most critical characteristics that you should look for in a tool? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. It's a better framing of the question. <laughs> well, More I'm neutral one thing. <laughs> um well i think it's um well the ease of use um that would be um you know sort of um, a really important part in fact actually sometimes something that's always forgotten um you know you can have an all singing dancing tool but if it's not easy to use then it's you know it's not really a all singing dancing tool <laughs> mm. so um and so i you know i think those are and i think also it's like, you know, where people are, you know, sort of um, have, you know, past, you know, sort of um, experiences um, and the environment. I mean, a lot of people find that actually they have the knowledge set in terms of, you know, what a you know, particular tool has done. And if it's, you know, if they can reuse their skill sets to actually, you know, sort of, um, you know, you know, sort of, you know, add on capabilities that's often a good starting point for a lot of um for a lot of um, um organizations if they're you know if they're using something that they're you know that they found that you know in some in another environment and it you know, provides that service but i would say ease of use is is really is very very important having good tutorials good you know mm -hmm. good training good you know good documentation you know because that really you know really really helps um um um, people, because otherwise, if you, you know, I've had examples where organizations have used a particular um, solution and then have gone down a particular yeah, path and then found that the documentation has sort of petered away. 
and that hasn't been you know that hasn't been really helpful so ease of use is a really important is a really important um, feature in my book and open making it almost yeah, also open how you know cross platform you know that you know because let's face it one of my things and I said in the study was you know hybrid IT you know if you look inside you know <laughs> peel open the covers of any organization doesn't matter if they're small organization and you look behind and they've got lots of tools <laughs> So, and the challenge is integrating and getting, you know, sort of um, seamless, you know, sort of um, functionality across, you know, tools. So I think openness is is one of the most important things as well. I certainly, I mean, I'm it's, sure it's interesting to strike, yeah, like to strike that balance between how many different tools do you need and like what's really driving the adoption of tools. I mean, the, one thing I, I think I touched on this a little bit earlier, but things are easier to automate when the thing that you're that you're automating is inherently more elegant or sophisticated right so it's easier to build a pipeline on kubernetes perhaps than it is on something else so as enterprises modernize and have to manage both heritage systems and heritage applications along with like really modern cloud native first you know containerized kubernetes deployed things those options that we have also in terms of the tools we can use and the goals that we can strive for they change um, and there's, I mean, there's an inherent, there's possibility there, but there's also challenge, right? There's always like the new thing that we were going for, but the fact that we still have to support the, the thing that we're moving away from. Um, so I guess, I don't know if you have thoughts on that in terms of either in, the, in terms of the last question on like managing different tools and moving, kind of progressing your, you know, kind of like where does it all start, right? We all, another thing, another theme that I see here is this idea of like you want to automate things. So there's the underlying tools getting better to make it easier, but at the same time, it also requires you just to fill certain prerequisites, right? You you have to, in order to automate things, it implies that you had automated testing built in by the developer. So there's all these little pieces that you're building on. Um, so I guess like, do you have any thoughts on on just how the industry is moving and how how to manage that transition? Um, I think that ties all into the question also of like, you know, bringing new ideas, the devs and the ops, like all of this new stuff is coming in. And I think here when we, a lot of times at conferences, you hear about the new things, but it's, it's about helping enterprises actually make that transition when they've got this, you know, the, 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 the weight of what they're, you know, what's, what's keeping them in business, what's important to them, keeping that alive and modernizing that as they also bring in new things. I don't know if you have, you know, things to say around that 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 topic in general i think the challenge that you say you know you're you're right i mean it's how do you you know how do you bring everything into you know sort of some sort of consistency um especially if you've got you know you're having to you know sort of build an application that might be on premise you know and then deploying it or sort of um, scaling it out to um a single cloud a multiple cloud all of those kind of things and i i think a lot of organizations look for sort of a level of consistency um in their you know sort of solutions but i also think that the challenge is is that sometimes you know i i said in in my yeah in my um, talk today that one organization we we're talking to that they started actually bringing in lots of different you know sort of um tools you know maybe not so much a you know partly best of breed um and they were trying to roll their own ci cd kind of pipeline um and doing their own scripting and they just found actually it was a bit it was actually quite challenging keeping everything in line. It was quite diverse and they had to focus a lot on, you know, sort of, you know, you spend a lot more time sort of um, and being a bit more skills. Um, what they found actually that they actually, to be honest with you, they looked to some of these other tools that actually did a lot of the pre-configuration for them um, and found that actually for the vast majority of what they wanted to do, it was fine. It was actually, you know, had a level of, you know, sort of, a, um, you know, cross-platform capability. They could move, deploy into other environments. And I think that is really key, having that level of consistency feeling that, well, how much do I want to kind of do, you know, how much control do I want? And am I okay with having something that's already pre-configured? And I think that's mm. the, you yeah, know, that's the question. It's, it's about productivity. You know, which one do I feel that I'm more productive in? And I may have more productivity if, if I'm thinking that I'm doing an application that's going across multiple environments. So I want a tool that, and so, you know, has that level of consistency and shows that I'm really, you know, sort of working up, you know, sort of at speed. But there may be an environment where actually I just need that tool to do, to work on that system because I that's that platform. 
is you know I'm chosen that because it's really important and it has the features and capabilities. So it's you know it's it's you know those are choices. There's a balance, but I think most people, a lot of people, like the eighty twenty rule. So pre configured environments, right. are, you know, cross platform certainly tend to outwin. <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have about 40 seconds left, so I just really w quickly want to, first of all, thank you enormously for, for being here for the conversation, for your excellent talks earlier. Um, I want to quickly tell people, uh, remember to stay for DevOps Party Games. Don't leave before that. We're going to be sending out a survey, so please fill that out as well. Recordings will be out on October 6th. And um, I wish I had more time for all of you, but thank you so much. It's been really a, a pleasure. and. Um, I hope I get another opportunity to talk to you all soon. And uh, that's Thank you. a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Lovely seeing you.